right, if you do have your Bibles, we're going to be taking a look at the book. We're going to be taking a look at John 5 this morning. And the name of my message, if you're taking notes, is The Sick, the Salty, and the Savior. If you would, bow your heads and let's ask God to bless our time together. Father God, we just love you. This is all about you, Father. We sense you're here. We sense your presence in this place. We sense your goodness in this place, Father. In the midst of so much bad news, Father, we sense that there is good news in this place, Father. That there is peace in this place. That there is purpose in this place. Or that you're doing something new, Lord. Let us not leave the same way we came, myself included, but do something new inside of us today. In Jesus' name, amen. We got any foodies in the house today? I am a foodie through and through. I think if you are born in Louisiana, it's just in your blood. I love to eat. I love food, but I'm not like, I don't like food from around here. Like, I'm not a hamburger and hot dog kind of guy. I like food from all over the place, different cultures, different places. But if I'm going to eat from a different culture, I want to eat something authentic, like the real stuff. Like, if I'm going to taco, if I want tacos, I'm not going to Taco Bell. Like, I don't want a Kit Kat quesadilla. I don't want a gordita where the, the... Bread is made out of a Dorito and covered in nacho cheese. How many of y'all have noticed that Taco Bell has just completely just discarded this whole health fad? Like they went the other way. And I respect that. They know their lane. I'm just saying in my before Christ days, I quit eating Taco Bell before I quit doing drugs because I knew one of them was bad for me. (laughs) But if Taco Bell's your thing, I'm not hating on you. Do your thing. But if I want tacos, I'm going somewhere where I can't even read the menu, you know. I'm going somewhere where the menu is in Spanish. Uh, We have one of our amazing greeters, Miss Hannah, and this lady can cook. She cooks some Vietnamese Vietnamese food that will change your life. How about our greeters and our ushers and our security and all of our volunteers that have done such an amazing job? Just so you let you know, we are hiring. We are hiring. But Miss Hannah will cook food that will change your life. Like, I've prayed for this lady every single day since I've gotten her food, that God blesses everything she puts her hand to and multiplies it, especially if it's food because I take leftovers. So when I got the opportunity to go to Kenya on my first mission trip, I was over the moon. I was like, man, this is going to be like the travel channel. We're going to be eating at all these amazing places, all this good food. We get there, and everywhere you go, they give you chai tea. And you're like Instagramming it, like, look at me. I'm a world traveler sipping my chai tea. I remember we went to this one school, and it was out in the jungle. And I remember Mr. David Ray Sr., him telling us, now, you know if they ever offer you food, you have to eat it. You have to finish. You got to clean your plate. Otherwise, it's very disrespectful. So we get to this school, man, and we've been preaching the gospel at these schools, and we preach the gospel, and and kids respond, and it's amazing. And the principal comes up, and he's so excited, and he invites us to come eat lunch with him. And I'm like, this is awesome. We're the guest of honor. I'm thinking, man, this guy's probably out back killing the fatted calf, you know, like we're about to eat. And I remember we sat down at that table and the guy walked by and he set down two pots and he said roots and meat. And I said, what's what's in that one? He looked at me and he said meat. And he took the top off that thing and it was like nothing I'd never seen before. It was like, man, he just put the whole animal in there and stewed that thing. And I remember getting a plate, and I took a bite, and it was like nothing I'd ever tasted before either. And then my friend sitting with me, who I thought was my friend, he goes, what was that, Chris? You want some more? And he puts another scoop on my plate. How I many you know with food, sometimes we can get a little too authentic too quick. But I believe in Jesus, we can never get authentic enough. You know, I think where we are as a country, where we are in the world, we need authentic Jesus. Like, we need the real thing. Like, not the safe, play it, play it safe, domesticated, come to church on Sunday, put them in your pocket, Jesus. But I'm talking about the one that's in the street, the one that's making, that's opening blind eyes, the one that the dead comes back to life when they hear his voice. I'm talking about the one that shakes our country up, the one who changes things. And I know we've been talking about, you know, so much that, you know, it might be the end times and it's crazy and this and that. And I know we tend to focus on the negative. But we got to remember also in Acts 2, it says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all my people. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you're black, you're white, you're poor, you're, off, you're rich, whatever it is. He says, all people. He says, I will pour out my spirit. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your, monk, your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants. 
men and women alike. He says, I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. And is this the end times? I don't know, church, but I do believe that we are on the verge of the biggest move of God we have seen in our entire lifetime. I believe that we're about to see the revival that we've been praying for. We're about to see the revival that our parents have prayed for, the revival our grandparents have paid for, but we can't play church anymore. We got to get to authentic Jesus. It's time for the real stuff. All I know is that I was always taught the darker a room gets, the lighter a bright a light will shine in it. And it's our time to shine. It's time for the church to take its rightful place to be a light on a hill that can't be hidden. We can't play church anymore. They need us. There's too many people that are lost. There's too many people that are hurting. And if we don't get back to this, if we don't get back to authentic Jesus, we can miss what God wants to do today. So we're going to take a look at God's word today, John 5. We're going to look at three different people in this story. And we're going to see what we can do to ensure that we don't miss out on what God is doing. John 5, verse 1, it says, Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. That's a long time. It says, when Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? It's kind of a funny question. And he says, I can't, sir, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But then this miracle happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry your mat, carry that sleeping mat. But he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. Who said such a thing? They demanded. The first man we're going to look at, we're going to look at the sick man. So let's take a look at this picture. It says that Jewish, that Jesus was in Jerusalem for a Jewish festival, and this is like a party. This isn't like a little get-together. Like, this is like the who's who of the Jewish zoo. There's hundreds and thousands of people that have traveled just to be at this party. And you think this is Jesus, right? In essence, this party is really all about him. It's all about God. This is a Jewish festival. But where do we see Jesus? Like he could be in the middle of the party turning water into wine and being like, what's up? I'm God. I'm here, you know. But we don't see Jesus in the middle of the party trying to be seen. We see him out with the hurting, with the lost and the lonely and the oppressed, making sure that they're seen. That's my Jesus. So it says that Jesus goes on to ask the man, do you want to get well? And it says that the man responds with, for I have no one to put me in when the water bubbles up. Isn't that so many of us today? Waiting on the right person and the right time, you know. Waiting on the right thing. Waiting on our big break. And maybe you're in here and, man, you're trying to start a business in the midst of all this craziness. And your thought is, man, if somebody just sees the potential in what I'm trying to do, if somebody just understands the potential in me and invests in me, everything will be better. Or maybe you're in here and you're single and you've been single for a long time and you hang your hope on, man, if just that one person comes and sweeps me off my feet, everything will be better. Or maybe you've been like me in the midst of this craziness and you just, you're discouraged, you're worn out, you feel stuck. Every time you make a plan, the plan gets canceled. You can't do this, you can't do this, you got to do that, you got to do that. And you feel so discouraged, you almost want to quit at times. And your whole thought process is, I can't wait until when. But the truth is, if we're stuck focusing on there and then, we can miss out on what God wants to do here and now. This man is face to face with God the Savior, and he almost misses out on what God can do in his life because he's focused on, if only I can get there. Man, we can't just wait for things to go back. we got to be reminded, like Pat Tabitha said earlier, that his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He's not up there saying, well, I didn't see this one coming. 
I feel like somebody in here needs to be reminded that although everything else may be canceled, his provision for you hasn't been canceled. His plans for you haven't been canceled. His peace for you hasn't been canceled. You aren't canceled. Our hope, our healing, our everything is not found in what our countries are doing or what the, the stock market is doing, what the economy is doing, what the virus are doing. Our hope is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. He is the fulfiller and the fulfillment of every and each longing of your soul. It's all about Jesus. But he asked, do you want to be well? It says instantly in verse 9, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leader objected. How many of you know there will always be a hater? There will always be someone that doesn't agree with you, that doesn't like you, that says something that you don't agree with. And the truth is that it's completely okay. We got to keep on walking. It says this man picked up his mat and he walked. But the sad part is that this hater in this story was supposed to be the helper. See, the guy who told him that it's illegal for him to carry his mat is the same guy who was supposed to be helping him carry his mat. He was the church leader in those times. But we see this leader so distracted, so offended. We see him get so salty. The second person we're going to talk about is the salty. He gets so offended that he doesn't even realize the miracle that had just taken place. Man, the first way we can miss out on what God's doing is by having our eyes on the wrong thing, by focusing on the wrong thing. But the second way we can miss out on what God is doing and what he wants to do is by through offense. It's through getting salty. It's through getting distracted by offense or getting critical or fighting the wrong fight. See, the truth is, if Satan can't defeat the church, which he can't, he's going to try his hardest to distract and divide. And right now, man, you don't have to look too far to get offended. Man, you just got to turn the TV on. You just got to look at your phone for a second. If you're looking for offense, you're going to find what you're looking for. It's everywhere right now. But it can cause you to miss out on the miracle that Jesus wants to do in your life, that he wants to do through you. You see, Jesus lived in a very polarizing day just like ours. You know, in his day there were Sadducees and there were Pharisees, and they hated each other. And they both used the word of God in order to do it. And it says that, you know, it was common in their day that they would even sit around and just debate. It's a lot of fruitless debating, fruitless discussion. Sounds a lot like Facebook today, right? I see some of y'all out there on Facebook letting people have it. And then you click on your profile and it's like you with your cafe free. It's like, I love HPC. <laughs> and I'm not hating on you because I've been guilty of it myself, church. It's so easy, man. You see something, you're like, oh, I'm about to set them straight. Man, this ain't right. I'm about to let them know how I feel. But we see these people in this day. And they didn't just sit around. They were sitting around and debating. But we see Jesus jump in and he says, you know what? I don't have time to debate. I'm going to jump in the ditch with the hurting. I'm going to jump in the ditch with the lost. I'm going to get and jump in the ditch with those who need me. Man, even this morning, if I'm being honest, when I first got this opportunity, I thought, man, this is my chance for me to share my opinion on what's going on, for me to say what I think is right. And the truth is, I was going to use the scripture to do it. And as I was preparing this message, I kept feeling a wrestle in my soul. And I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, Chris, put your sword down. You see, the thing about this story is that the Jewish man was right. It was illegal for this man to carry his mat on the Sabbath. It was illegal for him to work on the Sabbath. But the thing about it is that Jesus knew that the word of God was never meant to hold anyone down. It was meant to pick them up. We've got to put our sword down. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, it was never used to fight or attack your neighbor. It was, it was meant to fight for your neighbor. We've got to put our sword down. And you may be right, but if it involves attacking your neighbor, if it involves fighting the person on side of you, it involves fighting a person, man, you're, you're in the wrong fight. And this wrong fight, man, this offense, this getting offended or critical or, or focusing on what other people are doing, man, it will suck the joy out of you. It'll suck the life out of you. It'll suck the love out of you. It'll take everything out of you that God put in you in order to be a difference. It'll put everything, it'll take everything out of you that God has put in, order, in you in order to be the light in the midst of darkness. And it gets so dangerous. Man, let me put it this way. Where are the married folk at in here? 
We got some married folk in here. My wife and I have been married. Man, some of y'all, yeah, you clap your hands for your marriage. That's, that's what I'm talking about. But my wife and I, we've been married. We're about to make seven years next month. And if I'm being honest, I can't tell you the reason we've ever had one fight. And it's not because we don't fight. It's not because we don't argue. And I'm not talking about what Pastor Mike and Rachel do, talking about intense fellowship. We're not that saved. It's like marital UFC in my house. But the truth is, I can't tell you one reason we've ever gotten an argument. And you want to know why? It's because when we start arguing, I start focusing so much. See that, babe? I said I. I start focusing so much. I'm helping some of you married guys out in here. I start focusing so much on proving my points, on being right, that I completely lose focus on my entire purpose, which is to make sure that my wife is seen, to make sure that my wife is loved, that she's heard, that I am for her. Man, we can get so wrapped up and talking about what we're against, that we're never actually a part of what we're for. We can get so wrapped up in arguing about what's right that people don't understand what we actually believe in. They don't understand that we're for people, that we love people. And the enemy wants to use offense. He wants to use it. He wants to use it to get stuck in these debates because he knows that it builds a fence between you and those that you're called to love. It builds a fence between those you're called to share the gospel with, to show supernatural love to. Now, we've got to get back to Jesus. And we don't have time to get stuck in debates. There are people that are stuck in a ditch that need what's inside of you. They need to know that they're loved, that they're seen, that they're heard. And I love this verse, and I have to go back to it daily. It's in John 13, 35. And this is the words of Jesus himself. He says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Everyone will know that you are mine. He says, by this, everyone will know that you are mine. By what you post on social media? No. He doesn't say, by the policies that you stand for, they will know that you're mine. No, he doesn't say that they'll know you're mine because you don't do bad things. Or they'll know your mind because you come on church on a Sunday. No, he says, by this, they'll know your mind. And I'm preaching to myself in here. It says, by the way that you love one another. By the way that you love your neighbor, you will, they will know that you're mine. This is the litmus test for being a follower of Jesus. And you can look through every translation You can look this, there's no debate on this verse. He wraps it all up into this. They don't know if you follow Jesus by the way that you love your neighbor. Oh, it's so sobering. It brings us back to the heart of Christ. Who is your neighbor, you ask? The one that you don't want to love. The one who posts things that gets you upset. (laughs) The one who doesn't look like you. The one who doesn't vote like you. The one who doesn't think like you. This is the gospel. Man, we were filled with supernatural love to love in a way that nobody else can. See, the church was never meant to be a home for the spiritual and moral elite. It was meant to be a place for the hurting, the lost, the lonely, the ones who everyone else has given up on. And the truth is, is that if they don't feel comfortable in the house of God, it's not their fault. It's ours. Man, we got to remember what we're for. I feel like God is brokenhearted for the fact that the church is probably so much more well-known for what they're against. Guys, they get what we're against. They know what we're against. They've heard what we're against. But they're so confused about what we're for. If you're so wrapped up in your, what you're against, you'll never actually do anything that helps what you're for. And the enemy will fight so hard to keep us distracted. Because there's so much potential in this room. There's so much potential in this room. Just with the people in this room, social distancing and all, man, we could change our entire city. With those watching online, we could change our entire state. But the enemy is going to try to keep us distracted. There's power in this room. 
Everything that our city has been looking for is found in this room. It's found in Jesus and Jesus alone. And we're called to be ambassadors of the kingdom. This is our job. And it's time for the church to stand up and be the church. Man, I believe that there's people in this room that they know that God has called them to more. I believe either right now that the Holy Spirit is stirring inside of people. I believe that there's people in here that know he's calling them. I believe there's people in this room that know that they're supposed to go to HP College this year. There's people watching that know that they have a call of God on their life to preach the gospel, to share his love everywhere they go. I believe that there's people in here, there's somebody in here that's called to start a crisis pregnancy center. A place for unwed mothers that have no other option. I believe there's people in here that are called to adopt. You know, if one family out of every three churches in America, not every church, one family out of every three churches in America were to adopt, there would be no foster care system in America. There would be no orphans in our country. What do you think that would do for the pro-life movement? I believe that there's people in here that are called to, there's business leaders, there's business owners in here that are called to no longer focus on building their kingdom, but to start building his. Your calling is so much higher than you could ever imagine. He wants to use you to change what he's doing in this city. He wants to use you to be a part of what God's doing in our country. But we can't miss it. I believe there's people in here that are called to be small group leaders. God has blessed you with a home, a place that you can have people so they can hear the gospel and the love of Christ. I believe there's people that are here called to start outreaches. God has placed a passion in your heart, a desire for a certain group of people that are lost and are forgotten. And he's waiting for you to step up. I believe there's people in here that God has gifted you with a smile, a million-dollar smile. My boy Adam Clark was up here leading worship for the first time. This dude, God has given him a smile, and he's using it for the kingdom. We need you on weekend teams. We need you greeting people. People walk in these doors, they say, I saw something different when I saw that greeter. I saw a smile that I haven't seen all week. And God wants to use you to change somebody's life. You may not be able to change the entire world, but you can change somebody's world we got to remember what we're for. we got to get back to Jesus. We can't spectate anymore. It's time to participate. We can't be an audience of opinions. It's time for us as a church to be an army of life, an army of purpose, an army of love that sheds light everywhere that we go. And it all starts with the same call that it started with 2,020 years ago. The call from the third person in our story, the Savior. Do you want to be well? See, the thing about this story is that the man on the mat and the man who got offended are the same. One had nothing together. The other one had everything together. But they were both spiritually stuck. But that's where the Savior came onto the scene. See, John 1, 14, it says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. There's power in that verse. There's hope for somebody in that verse. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That verse, this story is a picture of empathy and empowerment. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Bible says that Jesus knew that this man had been sick and he'd been there for 38 years. That's longer than Jesus had been alive at this point. And how did Jesus know that? Because I believe that as Jesus, as a young boy, grew up going to the temple every year for this festival, Jesus saw this man. He saw this man there sick. He saw this man there lonely. He saw this man there stuck. And I believe as a child, he probably walked by and Mary and Joseph probably told him, oh no, son, don't go, don't go near that man. He's sick. And the Bible actually goes on to say that this man was sick because of his sin. And Mary probably told him, no, no, don't go over there by that man, Jesus. But 30 years later, Jesus couldn't help himself. 30 years later, it says that the word became flesh. See, we have a Savior that sees us who feels what we feel, who knows what we go through. He knows when we feel stuck or when we feel offended or when we hang our hopes on things of this side of heaven. He understands our frustration. And he asks, do you want to be well? So instead 
of staying in heaven. It says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He is compassion and capability. He didn't just leave us the Ten Commandments. He didn't just give us the word of God and say good luck. He said, I've got to get involved. Man, I heard a preacher say it like this. If I'm sick, don't throw me a medical book. Get me a doctor. Because that person personifies the principles that are in that book. If I get in trouble, if Freddie arrests me, Pastor David, don't throw me a book on the law. Get me a lawyer. Because that lawyer personifies the principles that are in that book. If I'm about to lose my mind, don't give me a book on psychology. Does anybody in here know the direction that I'm going with this? And Jesus looked down and he knew that this man was stuck in his sin. This man was stuck in his offense. And he said, I can't just leave them more rules. I can't just tell them to do this. I've got to get involved. And it says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he's among us in this place this morning. He's among us in this place this morning. He sees what you're going through. He knows the hurt and the pain that's in your heart. He knows the frustration that you're dealing with but he wants to get involved. He doesn't just give us more rules. He says, no, come to me. If you need peace, he doesn't tell you to do this, this, and this. He says, come to me. If you need purpose in the middle of a pandemic where it feels like you can't do anything, he doesn't say, go here and do that. No, he says, come to me. Whatever it is, he says, come to me. If you need clarity, come to me. See, he knew that he could not redeem us and be removed from us. And he dwells among us today. If you've been looking for something to give you life in the midst of all this, I have found a well. And his name is Jesus. And he's a well that never runs dry. He's a well that never runs out. But it's all found in Jesus. And he doesn't need our plan. He doesn't need our help. He doesn't need seven steps. He doesn't need 12 points. He just says, come to me. But it takes taking up your mat. No matter where you are, he only has to say the word. And I remember being in probably my 10th rehab center. It was the last one I was ever in. And I was lost. I was stuck. I was broken. I had nothing together. I remember sitting in there and there's a 12 step program and I'm not knocking 12 steps. I believe they're all biblically found in the Bible. I believe they're so beneficial, that they're so healthy, that they're so important. But I didn't even have enough time in there to work 12 steps. After three days of me being in this place on my knees, crying out to God, man, God instantly healed me of my 10 year addiction that I had. Man, I had no withdrawals. I had no more sickness. I had no more temptation to the point that the people in there said, there's no way he should be this happy. There's no way he should be this healthy. They went and searched my room looking for something. They said, this doesn't make sense. And I was actually the first person that they've ever graduated early. But it's because I took up my mat. I took up my mat. See, nowhere in the Bible do we see where Jesus tells somebody to say a prayer and go back to their regularly scheduled broadcast. I remember being on my knees in that place, and I finally, for the first time, I laid down my way. I laid down my plans. I laid down my agenda. I laid down everything that I'd put hope in. I laid down everything that I thought would make me whole. And that's when Jesus stepped in. He says, leave everything and follow me. See, our breakthrough is found in surrender. Your peace is found in surrender. All that God has for you is found in giving up. And giving up your will and giving up your way. And the truth is that your purpose and your healing are connected. It's all about laying down what your plans were for your life and saying, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. It's all about laying it all down and saying, Lord, I'm going to follow you no matter where you go, no matter what you want me to do, no matter who you want me to love. I need you. 
And I felt like God told me, man, there's people in this room that have been stuck for so long. They've been coming to church from Sunday after Sunday, yet they still feel stuck. See, this man, he was at the right place. He was at the temple, and he was at the holy place, yet he was still stuck because he had his eyes on the wrong thing. He had his eyes so stuck on what he thought was going to make him whole that he almost missed out on all that God had for him. See, we don't serve a bargain God. We don't serve a flea market God. I felt like God told me there's somebody in here, there's so many people who have an issue with bargaining. They think that the, the kingdom is just like everything else. That you can come in and you can say, God, I'll give you this, but I don't want to give you that. Yeah. I'll do this, but I'm not going to do that. Oh, I'll go hang with these people, but I'm not going to talk to that person. Because I saw what that person posted. And he says, I'm not a bargain God. I'm not a flea market God. If anyone knows what things that you get at the flea market, they end up broken. And you've been coming and sitting in these seats for over 30 years and you still feel stuck. You still feel frustrated. You still haven't seen the breakthrough that you hear that we sing about every Sunday. It's because we serve an all or nothing God. He says the one who lets go of his life will find life. But the one who holds on to his life will lose it. This is the God that we serve. And he's in this place, the flesh the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. And he asked us today, do you really want to be well?